Good morning. We're wrapping up a series. We've been in 1 Corinthians for a while. And let me tell a little bit about what we're going to talk about next time. There's a few series we've done that that have the ability to kind of shift a perspective. When we talked about the Beatitudes. Beatitudes is a place when you look at the text that it tells you things in such a way as to change the way we think about Christianity in a positive way. I think this next series could have be one of those same kind of series, Hebrews 2 through 4 describes a couple of things that when we get them in perspective, they're like two fields of vision, like a pair of binoculars. When you look through these fields of vision, you get a clear image. And with respect to God, there are two things about him that seem to be in conflict with one another. But in Hebrews 2 through 4, it meshes them together in a very, very powerful way. Sympathy and sovereignty. How does that work together, divine sympathy and divine sovereignty? That's what Hebrews meshes together. I think we'll find that it's a really practical, thoughtful series, and that'll start next week. Um, And as well, we are going to, uh, as you've seen, we might shift around, and JC is kind of the guru over Sunday mornings, and he has some ideas about shifting and reconfiguring, so you might find some changes next week, and you might not. Surprise. (laughs) But as we think about the series in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul has been tackling tough issues that were confronting the church there. He has called for changes in their sex lives and their social contacts, in their forms of worship, and in their legal dealings. He saves his harshest rhetoric for their Lord's Supper conduct, which is interesting. Uh, In the last section of his letter, he comes around to issues that we might have expected him to deal with earlier. There are issues that we in church in the 20th century deal with very often, but Paul doesn't deal with them until he is coming to his parting thoughts and he deals with the issues of money and ministers. See what he says in terms of money. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 through 4. Paul writes, Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you are also, you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Paul collected money from Gentile churches to relieve the suffering of Jewish Christians that were living in Palestine, living in Israel. And so when he went on his missionary journeys, especially his second and third, what he would tell the congregations of Gentile and Jewish worshipers who lived outside of Israel is that he is going to be taking a collection and that he's going to bring the proceeds of that collection to relieve the suffering of some of the Christians who lived, who Jews who lived in Israel. And in Israel to become a a Christian was to become a criminal. And when they followed Christ, they really basically committed financial suicide. The synagogue was the place where you did business dealings, where you schmoozed, where you got to know who was doing what and who was involved in what. And when they became Christians, they were a ostensibly putting themselves in a position where they were not welcomed into the synagogue. And so many Jews who professed faith in Christ lost their neighborhood and their livelihood. And the Jerusalem-based apostles, when Paul went back there and they were quizzing him about what your message is, they encouraged him to remember the poor in Jerusalem. And Paul was more than happy to do that. In fact, he earnestly 
embraced the opportunity to be able to help out, and that's what he did so long before he was asked. He hoped that the gift he collected would cement the bond between Gentile and Jewish Christian communities. He hoped it would demonstrate that Christian unity transcended ethnic barriers and that in Jews and Gentiles could get along as Christians even when the Gentiles did not become Jewish proselytes. So what he wanted to establish is that a Gentile didn't need to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. And one of the steps that he thought might help that if Gentiles collected money to bring to Jewish Christians, it would be an, a, an evidence of solidarity that they really do care, that they do support us. That's what Paul wanted to occur. And he also wanted Gentile churches not to forget their roots. Again, the initial evangelists that formed the foundation for the Gentile church were Jews. And he wanted them to remember their roots and, and the hardships of their Jewish brothers and sisters. Paul previously encouraged the Corinthians to participate. He doesn't go into a lot of detail about this collection. They already know. They know that Paul is collecting it and that he's going to bring it to Jerusalem. And so what he basically does is he gives them a few details. They must have sent a letter saying, how should we do this? And so what he does, he presents in a very matter of fact way how to collect the money. And the fact that it's so, there's no pressure, there's no gimmicks, there's no emotion, absolutely no hype whatsoever, just Basic, factual, practical. It's to be done regularly on the first day of the week, systematically. They are to set aside and save, not to be willy-nilly. It's something that they are to determine ahead of time. And on the first day of the week, regularly put some funds aside. It's to be done proportionately as they have been prospered. Not all will give the same. He's not a, he's not assuming that everyone will give the same amount. Some would give much more than a tithe, which he doesn't instruct them to do, but he does encourage them to give. And some would give very sacrificially as they've been prospered. And others would not be able to give as much, but everyone as he was able to, and freely so that no collections might be taken when Paul comes. He wants it to be taken care of ahead of time. So let's look at those regularly. It's on the first day of the week. Uh, the first day of the week, as far as a Jew was concerned, was Sunday. And that's when they were to take this money and set it aside. It was the day they, they worshipped together as Christians. Paul appears to avoid the term Sunday, because of the first day of the week. Originally, Sunday had a heathen kind of connotation to it, and... <coughs> It's okay that we call it Sunday, but in that time, Paul steps aside from referring to the first day as Sunday. He said systematically, and it seems that what's supposed to happen, each person is on the first day of the week to store up money privately. They're not to bring it to the church. There's not going to be a collection at the church. What's going to happen is they take this money, they put it aside on the first day of the week, put it in their home, and but to systematically make sure that they take care of this. Um, apparently, there's no offering plates that are sent around. Uh, there's to do it proportionately. Again, Paul is not demanding them to give a set amount of money. He's not telling them to tithe, but he is encouraging them to give. And we'll talk a little bit about that. He reminds the givers that God is the one who prospers them. And as God prospers you, then give. Uh, they are to give freely. Paul considers it a free will offering, a response to God's grace in their lives. It's by taking up the collection in advance, they are completely free in what they give. And apparently no one will know who contributed what. One thing that we determined at Hope in the very beginning was that those, only the financial manager really knows what you give. And the reason for that is 
believe that giving is between us and God, so leadership doesn't know what you give and what you don't give. Um, we feel like, again, that that saves us from either looking up or down, depending on that. It's, and so that's what Paul wanted, apparently, in this situation as well. Um, set it aside ahead of time. Do the collection ahead of time. Possibly Paul wanted to avoid being perceived as twisting arms to get money by asking in person. Or maybe he didn't want to take away from other focuses by demanding the money when he came. At any rate, what he said is, get this taken care of. You know what this is for. You know why it's important. So as you determine to do, set aside the money you've determined to set aside. Do it the first day of the week. Do it regularly and do it freely. And then when I come, I'll take this money and, and we'll bring it to Jerusalem. Paul deals with um, giving in his letters to Corinth. And what he's trying to do, he's trying to get them to do the right thing, give, give but to do it for the right reason. In Greco-Roman society, Christian works normally were done to being praised to oneself. This is the way it worked. Uh, giving to others displayed one's personal virtue and social power, not one's compassion necessarily. So when I gave, it's because I can give, and I, and I make sure others know that I'm giving. And so in so doing, I am kind of showing how influential I am, how powerful I am. Uh, people gave to others who were capable of, who were capable of giving them something in return, either through repayment in kind or through the bestowal of honor by lauding them publicly. Paul expects the Corinthians, though, to do good works for people so as to bring praise to God and not themselves, and that's why he has to deal with money when he talks to the Corinthians. He says, and when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. Um, what they're gonna do is get this entourage, and they're gonna take this offering, and if there's a bunch of people, they don't put a bunch of money on pack mules, which would attract the attention of robbers who would be on the road from where they were to Jerusalem. It's a long trip. So if they have a cadre of people, so then what they're able to do is people can put money belts on and, and wear things and sew it into the things. And so it's not obvious that this, this group, they, they thought things through when they did things when they figured out how we get from point A to point B. Paul was very practical, and this 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 offering was very important to him. So he wanted to do what he could to make it successful. Um, they are going to determine who they're going to send, and Paul's really okay that they determine that. He doesn't know if he's going to need to know or go or not, so he'll decide that when he comes and then they'll take care of that detail. Personal representation, again, from the Gentile churches is part of what Paul is looking forward to. What he wants is for Gentile Christians to show up in Jerusalem and for them to be able to come face to face with the apostles and their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. They wanted them there, not just Paul, and they wanted from their hands for these individuals to say, you know, I know that you guys are, um, you're suffering here and, and your pain matters to us and we just took this offering and, and we really wanted you to have this. I know that, that you can't work a job in Jerusalem because you forfeited that right when you became a Christian and I know that you don't have a lot of people to care for you, but I just want you to know that way, way far away in Turkey, you matter to us and, and we wanted you to have this. And it was a concrete representation of care. They would bring it face to face. And that's what giving feels like to Paul. It's free will and face driven. They, Paul sold this collection by talking about these individuals who are their brothers and sisters who are suffering. And that was the hook. 
So it wasn't based on a mandate. It wasn't forced. It was based on this is what's happening. And and because you're part of the family, I want you to give. And so they did so. And Paul wants that reflected when it's delivered. So the Jews get to see the Gentiles. And that's part of it as well. The Jews get to see the Gentiles and they get to say, Gentiles really don't care too much for us, but look at this. They they walked. How far did you walk? You how many weeks? And you and and you did that? Why? You did that because we matter to you? And those kind of reflections, those of you who give and enjoy giving, there is something about being able to meet a need. Even when it's not brought to your attention, that's what Paul wants them to experience from Gentile believers. Um, For Paul, again, giving is free will and face-driven, and he comes back to giving a lot in in his writings to these Christians in Corinth. There is a sheet in your worship folder. I think I'm going to read that through. Let's just read it together. It's I think we've done so before. Uh, It it has to do with a series from 2 Corinthians. Um, And let me read. Does God still command us to tithe? Um, Paul writes in his second letter to this community, which as we'll see is actually his fourth letter, but it's the second one that we have. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Well, Paul understood whatever captures your heart, captures your wallet. And so he's saying, I'm not commanding you, but I am testing the sincerity of your love. If it matters, it'll make its way to your wallet. That's what he seems to be indicating. Uh, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here's my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means, would probably happen, even though Paul sent these instructions in this first letter their follow-through still wasn't all that great, and he has to remind them, finish what you started. And in this letter, continues to remind them, um, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. New Testament giving must be willing, not coerced. This is why Paul was careful when he asked people to give to God's work. He tried to make sure giving was motivated by eager willingness. He didn't resort to commanding Christians to give. We're so used to heavy-handed financial appeals in religious settings that this kind of caution seems strange and unnecessary. After all, doesn't God command us to tithe? It's true that tithing... A tenth is commanded in the Old Testament. However, this requirement, a requirement as a law now, as a practice, it still exists. But as a law-based commandment, I believe that this requirement died when Jesus died. According to Old Covenant Jewish law, a tenth of one's possessions was to be given as alms for the poor, the support of priests, and the pilgrimage to the religious festivals in Jerusalem. Giving this tithe was not a suggestion, it was a mandate. Israel was a theocracy. 
The law of God was the law of the land. There was no separation between church and state. Religious leaders were also political leaders. Law enforcement personnel enforced the law of God. The three commanded tithes added up to about 25% of one's income, roughly equivalent to the tax burden in a democracy. When Jesus died on the cross, the old covenant was replaced by the new covenant. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Giving is encouraged in the New Testament. However, it is to be driven by compassion, not duty or obligation. When Paul visited churches as part of his missionary journeys, he encouraged believers throughout the Roman Empire to reach out financially to their oppressed Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. He, his appeals for money had faces attached to them, needy Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. The Christians in Corinth didn't hesitate to get involved financially. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Their motivation must have ebbed over time because Paul had to remind them to finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. Paul encouraged the Corinthians to give what they had, not what they didn't have. He didn't tell them to make faith pledges to God, in which they pledged money they did not yet possess, and then trusted God to provide it. Quite to the contrary, he writes, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Sharing with others who are in need is the focus of biblical spirituality. Jesus modeled this for us, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Free will, face driven. This is how giving works, this side of the cross. Paul talks about money. And he also talks about ministers, those who are entrusted with the work of making sure that the message of the gospel stays on point. Let's read what he says. Paul writes, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you, or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning your brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now, I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these, and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. May love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Um, The emerging problems at Corinth dictate that Paul is going to remain with them a longer period of time. That's why he says, he he politely, the purpose for the long stay is so they can send him on his way wherever he ventures next. It was his his, um, practice when he was in a place, he was a 
tent maker. And so he would ply that trade so as not to be a financial burden on the people that he was ministering to. He held to that in terms of his personal way that he did things. And then what he asked is, as he went from for Corinth to like another place, he would encourage individuals to send him on his way so that he might have some resources in order to start the work in another place. Um, he did then uh, allow them to equip him. And what he ends up saying is, okay, I'm going to stay a while. I want you to, to send me on my way. And it's, it's kind of a polite way of saying, I'm going to, I'm going to be there a while. And the other reason is because there's some things there that need some attention. And he has, he has written very precisely and practically about some of the things that they need to address. It's interesting. Paul understood his mission and what he can't do, he can't be everywhere. And so what Paul knows, he is in ministry to two, two things, two things. And if you ask him, what is your purpose? Two things. It's to guard the gospel. That's what he said. He guarded the message. He didn't guard the people. He guarded the message. What Paul understood is if he guards the message, if the message stays what it is, the message will change lives. So you guard the message. And secondly, you give the message to individuals who would be able to give it to others as well. That's why when Paul went from place to place, his primary order of business was to establish a footing in a place to find individuals who had a special capacity and heart to be able to understand the message, and he would appoint them to be elders in that place. Because when he goes from point A to point B, there's going to be no shortage of confusing teachings that are going to rush. And most people, they had no idea because the only Bible they had was the Jewish Bible, and some of the individuals who are raising questions were Jews. Well, look at it says this. So how can you say that Jesus is this and that? And they needed somebody in the city to be able to ask questions to. That's why Paul understood everywhere he goes, he's got to develop a group of people to stay there. If he does not do that, wolves will come in and there'll be no shepherds there to, to guard and to guide the people. That's why his objectives, guard the gospel, give the gospel to individuals who would be able to bring a focus into a city church where questions could be answered and the gospel could be understood. Again, Paul cared about all kinds of things. He cared about giving, he cared about morality issues. Paul's number one directive he saw himself as a steward, one who had been given a message that he was to give to the individuals that God sent him to. Paul was very clear about his purpose. And that's what he guarded, guarded the message and gave it to individuals who could give it to others as well. Uh, count no time wasted in being brilliant in the basics brilliant in the basics. We spend time talking about it, like the message of the gospel is the message of redemption. It's understanding what happens at the cross as clearly as you can, and just keep coming back. We'll continue to try to be clear about the message. Um, I think it's important. Paul then identifies some of the individuals that he has equipped. Timothy, it says, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. We don't know why he's saying, be nice to Timothy. You know, some people say, timid Timmy. <laughs> you know, and he was not a very strong individual. We actually don't know that really. It's, he's not as strong as Paul, but not, not many people were as strong as Paul. Um, he had a little stomach issue. Some individuals indicate, well, that must be because he's nervous, and we just don't know. Um, what we do know is Paul has sent a very harsh letter, and when you send a harsh letter, he is not going to be the one to be there. Now, there are three guys, we're going to meet them in just a little bit, who are going to take 
they took the letter from Corinth to Paul, who was in Ephesus at the time. By the way, on the back of the, uh, the sheet with the text, there is an outline of Paul, just as if you're interested. It's a, I copied out of a Christian magazine, just an outline of kind of the, the highs and points of Paul's life, kind of what he started and where he went, and just, just wanted you to have that. At any rate, um, um, he then has sent this letter. These guys bring it. The letter will get there uh, before Timothy gets there. And then Timothy is Paul's spokesperson. So Paul says some really harsh things here. He, he speaks to them very aggressively and assertively. And when Timothy comes, perhaps he doesn't want Timothy to get egg on his face. You know, kind of don't shoot. I'm only the messenger. But Timothy is the one who represents Paul. And Paul is saying, this is my stuff, but don't take it out on Timothy. We really don't know. Um, Apollos, this is kind of interesting. You get the sense that this, Paul and the people he travels with, they're not a band of brothers. What we know is that when Paul went on his first missionary journey with John Mark, who was Barnabas's nephew, Barnabas was there, John Mark was there, uh, John Mark bailed out when they got to one of the early spots. And then when they were going on their second missionary journey, uh, Barnabas said, John Mark wants to go along again. And, and Paul says, oh, my dead body. So anyways, Paul and Barnabas, they had such a conflict that they split up. They stopped traveling together, which might seem that's too bad. But you know, it's interesting. Hostility is something that God can even use hostility. What ends up happening, Barnabas ends up taking um, Mark, who becomes the Mark who wrote the gospel. And under Barnabas's careful tutelage, Mark developed. Paul wouldn't have been as patient with him as Barnabas was. Different gifts if an individual, Paul ends up taking Silas, who ends up being a very profitable worker and ends up developing a relationship with Timothy. So even though there's hostility, in fact, in this letter, Paul talks about a that he can't come to Corinth right away because a door has been opened for the message. And the door has been opened by the presence of a bunch of adversaries. But what Paul understands, if there's a bunch of adversaries, that doesn't necessarily take away from evangelism. In fact, it spurs it. So what Paul understands is if everybody's talking about it, everybody's talking about the message. So Paul's glad for the presence of hostility because it actually helps its work. Um, uh, but Apollos, it seems uh, Paul... Um, strongly urged Apollos to go. And again, if Paul asks you to go and he's the apostle to the Gentiles, it, it takes quite a backbone to say, no, nah, I don't think so. But that's what Paul, Apollos ends up saying. Apollos is a Jew from Alexandria. He is, he again, was really good at speaking. He was an excellent orator and people wanted him because he was so, his, his understanding of the message was not as clear as Paul's. He, Paul ends up saying that he went in, in Turkey somewhere and he was talking to individuals and he said, how did you find out Apollos taught us? Oh, that's great. Uh, and he says, tell me about the, the Holy, what? And they had never heard about the Holy Spirit. And so Apollos had been there and he left a few things out, not because he was trying to be not effective. He just didn't know as much. And so Paul had to direct him to some others, individuals who we'll mention later, Priscilla and Aquila, and they helped this guy know what the details are. So Apollos was a very good communicator, but you get the sense that I'm not sure that there was a little bit of a kind of a, tete-a-tete, face-to-face, Paul says, go, and Paul says, nah, I don't think so. Okay, God bless you. <laughs> Paul doesn't, so, uh, not necessarily a band of brothers. There was Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. It says, now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia. 
They have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus because they have made up for your absence. They refresh my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition, give recognition to such people. These guys probably were the ones that took the letter from Corinth to Paul, asking the questions that Paul responds to in this letter. Paul gives them this letter and they bring it back. And what he says as they will deliver this, he'll say, boy, these guys, these guys really did something. You know, they were, they, they took this communication to me, they stayed with me and they took it back to you. These kind of people matter. Those who don't just say that they want to serve, but those who actually serve, who serve and ex- demonstrate it in terms of shoe leather. And that's what he ends up saying. Uh, Paul understood that he, again, he could not be everywhere. So what he does, he focuses and cultivates others' understandings and encourages them to know the message and to do what they can to bring others in their sphere of influence to understand the message. Um, And that's our opportunity as well. As best as you can, be brilliant in the basics. I think there's some things that we're going to learn over the course of this next series. I think that divine sympathy and divine sovereignty are two things about God that when they are brought into focus, I think are extremely powerful. And so in terms of having an understanding of sympathy and sovereignty, um, that's what we're going to learn over this next series. And I think that it's going to be interesting for us. Um, Paul writes, though, um, he wants to make the gospel clear because wolves, he understands, are going to come into his people and try to create confusion. He says, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you, or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now, just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. This ends up getting him in trouble. When he ends up saying, I'm going to come and visit you. What ended up occurring though, um, that these initial plans changed and he had to make, he changed his plans. He had to make an emergency voyage to Corinth that proved to be very disheartening for Paul. Here's what we learn in 2 Corinthians. I'll just read this. Uh, Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace, both to and from Greece. He wanted to pay a couple visits. He ends up not being able to do so. And he's explaining to them, I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes and yes and no, no at the same time? What ends up happening? He changed his plans and some people are blowing him up. Uh, was he was he acting according with God's will? He said he did say he was going to come and he didn't come. Hmm. And he is a apostle of God and he changed his mind. And Paul says, come on, come on. I, I, I intended to come, things changed, but... But whatever, everything what Paul does, there's individuals who are ready to nip at him. He ends up, when he's in Corinth, when he's in Corinth, having a nasty confrontation with an individual that causes him to bid a hasty retreat. It was dicey in Corinth. That's why they say, take care of Timothy, because what ends up, well, let me read what Paul says in 2 Corinthians about what occurred when he went there on this change of plans visit. 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4, here's what it says. I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you, for if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. What ended up happening, Paul made a second trip to Corinth that was very painful. And he ends up having to leave and he writes this painful letter that we don't know about, but it's it's one in which he has to be pretty direct with them and he doesn't know if they're going to open their hearts to him or not. So 
1 Corinthians is actually the second letter that Paul writes. Then there's this painful letter. Then 2 Corinthians, our 2 Corinthians, is actually the fourth. So all you need to know in terms of 1 and 2 Corinthians is 1 equals 2 and 2 equals 4. 1 Corinthians is actually the second, 1 equals 2. 2 Corinthians is actually the fourth, 2 equals 4. 1 equals 2, 2 equals 4. We don't have the painful third. But anyways, Paul writes, um, For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. And so we come to then the communion. Love matters to Paul, matters to God. And so what he does then, he brings them back to the thing that he was most disturbed by in this letter. Again, there's all kinds of things happening in this place. There's sexual acting out, and there's this maybe even cross dressing There's all kinds of stuff, but the thing that Paul really pins in this letter more than anything is what's happening at communion. What's happening, they're coming together, they bring their own meals, and they eat the meals together. Some end up showing late their servants and perhaps slave, and they just don't have that much to eat. And others who have plenty to eat are coming for this communion meal celebration, and they're just down in the stuff and drinking the wine, and there's individuals who don't have enough to eat. And Paul's saying, what in the world are you doing? This is not the way this works. This is not about just make sure you and God are fine. It's a family. We're a community. We take care of one another. And that's why I'm bringing this offering, because you are brothers of the individuals in Jerusalem, and I want you to get the money together because I'm going to take it there, and I want you, some of you to go because they're going to get it from your hands, and it's going to matter to them. They're going to understand we are a family with Gentiles. And so Paul wants to encourage more than anything that this is something that's for brothers and sisters, and that's what brings us to the table. Um, it's a place where we experience something together. And if you name Christ and you believe in him, you don't have to be a member of this church. This is something we are to do as family. It represents the covenant meal that we will experience there. Well, all many is who are believing in Christ will be there. And it will be the inauguration of a covenant. This is a forecast of that. And so when you just, there's just a table in the back and there's not one on the front for today. So just go grab the bread and the juice. There'll be some music. And sometime during the course of that music, take it as family. This is something that Jesus opens the doors so that we could be members of his forever family. This is the first of not the first, but the next in a line of more communion services on this place. And it's a forecast of the, the covenant meal that would usher in our eternal existence with him. That's a real thing. And, and again, one of the major things that Paul talked about, that Jesus rose from the dead, and it happened. And what he said, what happens to him happens to us. They tried to find the body, and they couldn't. He really did rise. And he really does say that these bodies are going to go into the ground like a seed. A seed is a bare seed. It's not very glorious, but then it's going to come up out of the ground because Jesus did. And we're going to follow in turn. He is the first fruits. That's what we look forward to, and that's what this meal is about. It, it represents who we are, children of God, and it does not appear what we shall be, but when we see him, we'll be like him, for we will see him just as he is. Take the juice and the bread and give thanks for Jesus, for the Father, and his desire that we will be members of his forever family. you for um, the message of reconciliation. Thank you for individuals like Paul 
who you called to steward this message for the sake of we Gentiles, and that the message has been captured, has been put in words, and so now we're in a position to be able to understand what this message was, and we have the chance to be able to hear Paul as he writes these letters. You really want us to know the truth about who you are, how you feel, what the message is. You would have us guard this message and try to transmit it as as well as we can. Would you continue to allow us to understand and reflect? In Jesus' name, amen.